Let's talk some sophomore quarterbacks. We'll go through some of the NFL Week 12 games, work our way through and look at how some of these players are either improving, maybe taking a step back or maybe taking a step forward. And Sean, I want to start with the one that is maybe taking a step forward and they really put a little bit of pressure. I'm sure it was uncomfortable for you looking and watching. Have they taken a step forward or the Kansas City Chiefs taken 10 steps back? Well, the Kansas City Chiefs now have 10 wins. I don't know if they count as steps, but 10 and 1 on the season after their loss last week. They do get a win here with a walk off field goal against the Carolina Panthers, who are 3 and 8 on the season. But the player that I want to look at is Bryce Young. He has 21 completions of 35 attempts, 263 passing yards, one touchdown, no interceptions, takes two sacks, has three rushes as well for 20 yards in this contest. I think there's a, a huge improvement here, a huge step forward. He obviously starts the season, looks terrible, looked terrible as a rookie. Uh, benched, then we get the situation where Andy Dalton is out for a couple of weeks, comes back in. They've won two games in that time. They almost get a result here against the Kansas City Chiefs, leads them on a drive at the end of the game where they need to get a touchdown and two-point conversion to tie it up. Unfortunately, it wasn't enough to push it to overtime. But I thought he looked tremendous here. Some fantastic throws. There is still some, you know, warts i guess that you have to work through but from where we were let's say 10 weeks ago to where we are now i think the there's you know i don't know if it's just the time set now if it's if he's talking to andy dalton and getting great advice if he's watching dalton and saying maybe i should try that uh but he he looked uh really good here he also had a pretty hot start with uh jatavion sanders who had three receptions for 49 yards but did get injured on a pretty a scary situation where he kind of got tackled but he flips up and lands on his, his head and neck area got stretchered off does look like um you know he's still under evaluation but has been released from hospital looks like long term the outlook and the pro prognosis will be hopefully positive for that he has looked impressive as well as a rookie over the last couple of weeks he's playing this game sean where it's adam thielen with four targets he has three receptions for 57 yards Leggett has six targets, four receptions for 56. And I mentioned Sanders obviously going out to the other player, David Moore, shot 10 targets, six receptions for 81. So he, he's doing a lot of heavy lifting here, and that is Bryce Young. What was your thoughts here on not necessarily how close the Panthers pushed the Chiefs, and the Chiefs' defense is a, a tough matchup. Um, Bryce Young, are you surprised? Are you pleasantly you know, impressed. What's your thoughts on, on Young here over the last couple of games? Yeah, I think that when you start from the position that he did over the you know, first season and several games of his career, the performances like this are incredibly encouraging. You have a target depth that, you know, isn't aggressive, but is certainly fine. This is another game, which is you know what happens every week. I mean, he has two additional air yards per pass above Patrick Mahomes. The decision making is better. The accuracy is better. He looks like a completely different player now. One of the things I've been writing about with him for the dynasty pieces, for the Monday pieces, is that even with what he's doing now you're mostly just hoping that he can be one of these low ceiling game manager types of quarterbacks i still think that that's probably the case but you think about the surrounding cast at this point and david moore is somebody who has played well you know as you mentioned draws the 10 targets in this one gets the touchdown they have obviously been wanting to go to him a little bit more anyway they moved deontay johnson who they thought was going to be part of the solution he was just a bigger bit of the problem they get adam Thielen back in this game he is more or less corralled but he does draw some important interference calls and a late hit or not a late hit but just a helmet to helmet hit in the end zone all of those things were helpful for the panthers sanders as you mentioned looked fantastic it was really unfortunate i think that jalen coker wasn't able to play in this game one of the things the panthers need to be able to do down the stretch in the season is to evaluate him see yeah. where he might fit but yeah i mean this is a, a great performance the chiefs leave him in the game if anything you're kind of looking at this game and even though kansas city ends up with more first downs more total yards more time of possession 
they don't commit turnovers. And you're thinking, well, in a case like that, they, you know, almost certainly won and perhaps won fairly easily and deserve to win. I guess I don't even necessarily think that that is the case, right? The problem that the Panthers had in this game is they settle for field goals. They get the three first half field goals, and then they get the field goal when they are trailing 27, 16 to get it within eight. You look at what they do down the stretch of the game there to then tie it, but they set up for Kansas city to have the time left to go and get the field goal, which at that point, especially at the Panther defense, you know that they're probably going to do another one of these very depressing types of performances from the chiefs. If you have their, fantasy pieces Noah Gray the big scorer in this one you don't get a ton of dynamism from Travis Kelsey you don't get a lot of involvement from Xavier Worthy you do get the score from DeAndre Hopkins but if you're playing him it's basically just hoping for a touchdown here I mean the one thing that we got in this one is that Patrick Mahomes showed off the wheels those extra six points in the run game in scramble mode certainly are helping you in fantasy if you were still playing him. Colin, this week featured a couple of our key guys not getting some points that they probably were set up to get. We went through our team on the show, broke it down last Friday. It was kind of amusing kind of going through the different teams. I have a team that I drafted with my sister in the main event, which was a lot of fun uh, doing that with a family member there, where... We have a lot of similar players, including and in especially the Jalen Waddle, Nico Collins duo, where Collins obviously out, doesn't get the long touchdown last week. While he is absent, you get some invisible. Unpa- yeah, well, invisible, right? <laughs> you get some unpalatably bad play from Jalen Waddle. So he goes to the bench. Xavier Worthy stays in the lineup. Nico Collins has the touchdown robbed again this week. Xavier Worthy had a play they had drawn up for him that was going to be a walk-in touchdown. There wasn't even a defender on that side of the field, and one of his teammates decides to false start. That's disappointing. You have the play with Nico Collins where he gets another long-ish touchdown, but despite a teammate going in motion like in his line of sight, Joe Mixon decides he'll also go in motion as the ball is snapped. Joe Mixon didn't have a great game. Uh, Colin, but And also, as we alluded to yesterday, Jordan Addison benched on both of these teams. Uh, I know that the listeners are incredibly engaged in this, so I will pass along that we scored 179 points, my sister and I, and are going to make it, despite all of those problems. That's the joy and the beauty of Trey McBride and Bucky Irving. So you play those guys, you probably had a pretty decent week, but Colum... The Chiefs can't even run the plays they've got designed for easy Xavier worthy touchdowns. Your point though, Bryce Young, he looks good. He looks good. And that's a great story. He seems like a cool dude. And I just, these guys who get picked number one overall, I mean, obviously they've had pretty good lives to that point. A lot of people haven't, but it still is kind of heartbreaking for them when you know the expectations and you know that big U turn that your life takes if you're the number one overall pick in the NFL draft and you're a bust. It would be great if he doesn't go through that. Yeah, I'm I'm like I find myself since he's come back into the team in particular, like really rooting for him to to have success. And part of it is just that the story of how things have have gone so far for him in the NFL. Sean, you mentioned the false start on the Chiefs. I, I would cut the Chiefs offensive lineman a little bit of slack there because he probably doesn't know that the Chiefs can get called for you know false starts because Usually they just get away with that sort of thing. So, uh, we'll we'll say that's why that's why he did that. Um, on the uh, overall outlook, Sean, though, you mentioned some of the players there. Hopefully, by the time people are listening to this, we'll have got through in the main event as well. But that was a team where we have started worthy this week in case there was an explosion of points against the Panthers. Uh, that team, Sean, sat both Jalen Waddle and Jordan Addison, who combined for sixteen receptions, three hundred and six yards, and two touchdowns. So. Uh, if we make it into the playoffs, we're we're well set. Uh, just we we left them on the bench this week, but the next game we are we got a lot to... of fire going into the playoffs. I mean, yeah. they have to know 
they, the they have to be hungry. Are. They have mm-hmm. to really work to get into the starting lineup. That's our that's our plan. Um, but then, Sean, we have the Titans and the Texans. Some sophomore quarterback action here with CJ Stroud. Well, Levis is involved. Well, Levis takes eight sacks for 41. He's under a lot of pressure in this one, but they get the win 32 to 27. The Texans have had lots of struggles in different areas of the game, not just uh, on offense, but some of the special teams issues and so on as well. Joe Mixon, you mentioned, did struggle in this. He had 14 carries for 22 yards. CJ Stroud had three for 18 yards on the ground. Nico Collins, Sean, has nine targets, five receptions, 92 yards, and a touchdown. He does also have that touchdown that you referenced that would have tied the game in the fourth quarter, called back. It was a 33-yard touchdown on the legal shift. Then they missed that field goal to tie the game. There was lots of different, a bit like we talked about with the Bears game and then also um, with the Cowboys game, there was a lot of weirdness in this particular uh, scenario. We had an 80-yard kickoff return for the Texans to kick this one off that led to the Stover passing touchdown for Stroud on the first kind of play from regulation Um, Nico Collins on his touchdown looks pretty much unguardable I think it's pretty unfair uh, to try and get some people to to match up with him but uh, we had Nick Westbrook Akine again get in the end zone he had a 38 yard touchdown in this one Uh, another week another touchdown that's what I read from my notes Uh, (laughs) I believe now, Sean, it's six of the last seven games he has got in the end zone. Uh, Chico Conco had one target, one reception in this game, but that's okay when that goes for 70 yards and a touchdown. He showed off some of that uh, long speed when he got in, but we had a lot of Texans errors. We had muff punts, uh, a number of different scenarios, but we did have them pick up on defense with a pick six off Will Levis on his interception. Tony Pollard, Sean, looking pretty good again in this. He has 24 carries, 119 on the ground and a touchdown also at three for 10 through the air calvin ridley six targets five receptions 93 yards tank dell although the numbers aren't massive for him i do think he's starting to look healthier i've mentioned that a few times three for 72 for him sean nico collins is an incredible wide receiver and he's i think he's gonna be in for a huge finish to the season that pushes him way up again in adp for 2025 drafts but I guess the talking point here is CJ Stroud, 20 of 33, 247 yards, two touchdowns, two interceptions, four sacks for 27 yards. There are certain things that, that Stroud's doing that you're like, that's that's very positive. But unless it's a, a big play really to Nico Collins, he does also have a 39-yard completion and this one to Tank Dell. And like we talked about, touchdown being taken off the board as well, which would have given him a third touchdown. And they're probably going to overtime at that point. But then you get the play that ends the game and you're trying to extend it and, and get a play, but it's third and 17 and he gets sacked. If he doesn't get sacked, he's probably just going to walk out the back of his own end zone to finish things off. So there's there's real head scratching plays in there. And after what we've seen as a rookie, what is, uh, Sean's laughing, what, what are some of your thoughts here on Stroud and the, the Texans here as we move forward. I don't even have that many thoughts on the Texans because they have just decided to be an incredibly boring team that also makes a lot of backbreaking mistakes. The Titans, on the other hand, are a roller coaster. At one point in this game, it seemed like Will Levis might get sacked 20 times. <laughs> He had a he had a like a, a five play stretch where I think he was sacked four times in this game. He fumbles. He throws one of the worst pick sixes that you will ever see. He really ran hard though to try and get back to make a play on it, but that didn't happen either. Full force. I mean, All of <laughs> Will Le- Will Levis with this game became one of my favorite quarterbacks. I think in part because I had to play him a couple of places. Colin, when you have a lot of or at least some very important Brock Purdy, Joe Burrow teams. Uh, you had to make some contingency plans late in the week and throw some guys out there that it's like whatever is left on waivers, you're going to play. We talked about it a lot last year, how Will Levis competes. He's got this great arm, no accuracy whatsoever, right? But a huge arm. He's so big, I, I will, he's I will athletic. Say he's competitive. Uh, what he's competing at i don't know but he he is competitive (laughs) so i i maybe haven't given him enough credit for 
like being I don't know. You go back and forth on some of these, and we're gonna get to this game in a moment. But I've been suggesting that he's below the level that you could really ever just continue to be a starting NFL quarterback. And probably this game doesn't do anything other than tell us that the Texans are a train wreck. Because when you were getting sacked, committing turnovers, throwing pick sixes right and left, the fact that you managed to get a 70 yard touchdown to a Conquell and managed to throw that touchdown pass to Westbrook Hakine, that doesn't wipe away all the rest of those problems. You would have still lost to like 30 NFL teams. But I love it. I love that they won this game and that and Will Levis outcompeted the entire Texans team, despite the fact that like, the defenders like, I don't know how you think that we like we could compete better because we sacked him like almost every single time they dropped back. This is a weird one. I, I I mean, if the running back is supposed to make that horizontal motion in order to set up other things that the play wants to accomplish which we see a lot now and it's a very normal type of action pre-snap we don't know for sure that he was the guy who wasn't supposed to move but i mean rule change yes doesn't as much motion as much motion doesn't matter doesn't matter you can go down the field as a blocker why are we limiting the things that the offense can do and making the sport worse however I, that play is is pretty frustrating, but I think the thing far, that has far been maybe the most disappointing is that you look at C.J. Stroud's body language and it is absolutely terrible. The look on his face after the mistakes is different than say Levis's, where for Levis it almost seems like all oh, these are baked in. He's like, I mean, was he upset after he threw that pick six? Yes, he was furious, but it was a more like I'm gonna go like do something else crazy kind of look than. Stroud's where I mean Stroud just seems utterly demoralized at this point despite arguably being the biggest passing talent currently in the NFL yeah I think there's a lot of that I think that has to go down on some of the offensive uh, play calling and design but the other part I was going to mention Sean for that like we're we're here and like it's it's been a tough run here for for Stroud in year two there's been some flashes, but there's been a lot of things where you're like left scratching your head. But like if again, if the the pitcher's changed and Nico, the the pitcher changes for Nico Collins, obviously last week if that 75 yard touchdown counts in the it counts this week, that's just for Nico Collins. But that that adds another you know hundred yards and two touchdowns over the last two games to CJ Stroud as well. So that there's a you know there's there's a chance that things could go better if they if they stop uh, with all these penalties. <laughs> Yeah, and you have to think through some of the big plays. I mean, I at this point, obviously nobody is going to take seriously the fact that some of... I mean, they're going to take seriously, but they're going to understand that a lot of the big runs from Barkley are just on him. I mean, he's that explosive. You're going to get some big plays. If you think about that week one performance from Anthony Richardson where he hits the long passes, and those plays are difficult. They're not that replicable. And you need to sort of think about what he's going to do without those plays in most games. You think to Jaden Daniels and what we've gotten with the Hail Mary and then the 80 yard touchdown at the end of week 12. I mean, those passes are super fluky. You're probably getting a more accurate picture. If you take them out, you think about the plays to Xavier worthy. You're probably getting a more accurate picture. If you put at least some of those back in, it's, very unlikely that they would have missed on all of those. And then you think about Nico Collins and the plays that have been wiped out. You're probably getting a little bit more accurate picture. If you include at least a portion of that, as you're thinking through where he is and where CJ Stroud is, it's just been unfortunate that they have failed to execute the touchdowns plays that they had otherwise set up very, very nicely. Moving on to the lions and the Colts, the lions, only the 24 points this week, Sean. They didn't run the score up as high as they have been, but 24 to 6, they get a win there. 10 and 1, them and the Chiefs now 10 and 1 on the season. Quieter day for Jared Goff, 269 passing yards. We get Jameer Gibbs, Sean, working more in, in terms of rushing 21 to 8 in terms of the rush attempts between him and David Montgomery. Montgomery gets in the end zone with 37 rushing yards to go with it. Jamar Gibbs has 90 yards on his 21 carries and two touchdowns. I was surprised for both of these guys, but Gibbs in particular, just the three targets apiece to them. Gibbs 0-3, 4-9. Uh, in a game where Jared Goff, 
throws the ball 36 times. I was surprised that they only ended up with the three targets apiece. Gibbs, the second touchdown. You know, some of these some of these players with their athleticism, it's just looks so so easy for them trying to we we kind of joked last week with Jamison Williams and his touchdown run and the the athleticism there and the the speed but we've seen it with Gibbs again this week they I, I mentioned the split as well in terms of the the rushing there was a shoulder injury for uh Montgomery late in the third so that will have impacted it a little bit but it was kind of leaning that way prior to that they do play on Thursday night so we'll see how that bears out for Montgomery but does sound like he should be available Sam Laporte Sean three receptions for 19 yards for him he is getting more targets in recent weeks but uh, the production has been lagging a little bit behind but on the sophomore quarterback watch we did have anthony richardson 11 of 28 172 yards passing hit 10 for 61 on the ground michael Pittman had 96 receiving yards six receptions seven targets josh downs also had seven targets he just had three for 27 so there's a couple of things to talk about here is it back to reality after a big week against the jets is it a case that sometimes we can look at the accuracy of richardson which is a problem on many occasions but the receivers also letting them down we did have drew ogletree drop a goal line reception which would have been a touchdown in the second quarter and this one uh doolin forget doesn't get his feet in bounds on a 40 yard completion and then there was a 30 yard a 21 a 21 and a seven yard gain all nullified by penalty so there's kind of a, a bit of a roller coaster here as well with anthony richardson what was your thoughts on his performance here and, and hit me with any thoughts you had on the lions as well the lions were just boring and disappointing and it's it's tough when you have all of those weapons and tim patrick goes four for 55. now they need that additional sort of possession threat you're not going to get extreme concentration every week but for Goff to throw 36 times to not score well himself and for his receivers to not score well that's disappointing this Indianapolis Colts defense has been doing some nice things they kept them in this game for a while before you get to the point where Anthony Richardson is just not allowing you to move the ball obviously when you are 11 for 28 you're not completing most of your passes when you're three for 12 on third down and oh for one on fourth down you're not keeping those drives going you end up having a 72 49 split in total plays here i did think that the officiating in this one was a little bit iffy they ran a beautiful sort of pick play for josh downs down the field didn't even have contact with the defender and yet still called for offensive pass interference i think that the nfl definitely has to look at those rules again the offensive player should be able to run around on the field without being called for offensive pass interference if they're not touching defensive guys uh, so that part took away some plays he had a relatively nice pass that could have gone for a touchdown for Josh Downs that was just off the fingertips. Now that was an insane effort from Downs to try and go get the ball. We talk about guys who make extreme plays in terms of the leap, the stretch, all of those. And Downs had been struggling physically when he made that play and was shaken up again afterward. He had the seven targets. We know that he has the potential to have huge games. You get that touchdown or you get the other play where you had the offensive pass interference and it looks quite a bit different. I don't know that Richardson in some ways played as bad as the 11 for 28 indicates, but you're simply going to have a lot of incomplete passes when you're pushing the ball down the field like he is. And that's a little bit the design, right? That's what he does well. He has absolutely zero accuracy underneath. So you can't really set up a quick passing offense. You want to challenge the defense vertically, ideally open up some room for him to run, some room for Jonathan Taylor to run. Taylor had a terrible game as well. Part of this is just that the Detroit Lions have a fantastic defense. When you're thinking about the verticality of it i mean his adot is above 13 so i mean those passes are going to be much harder to complete at the same time column 
the kind of nail in the coffin for me. And so I hold myself accountable for, <laughs> you know, getting pulled in by some of the results. We know that games like this are extremely likely to happen for Richardson, but when you are struggling to try and figure out how you're going to get some of the quarterback production, I mean, I have said on the show that when he was benched, I went ahead and tried to pick him up everywhere because it was likely that at some point he would start again and that he would have extremely positive high end outcomes in his range of outcome. He also has this, right? As you're watching this game, if you have started him in some important leagues, the one that is sort of the backbreaker is a third down play where they needed to go for it on fourth down if they didn't convert the third down. He ends up getting in a situation in the pocket where he feels a little bit of phantom pressure. And this is one of the things that our college football guys really emphasize to us. We think about Travis May, his appearance on the show, where like you have to understand that he doesn't take sacks. But it's not because he does the normal things the quarterbacks who don't take sacks do. That was a pretty awkward way to phrase that. Basically, Richardson feels pressure that isn't necessarily there and then inaccurately throws the ball away. That's not a way to sustain a drive, right? You want to be able to hold and wait for your guys to come open. Probably not as long as Will Levis does, but you want to wait for the play to develop. And if it's not there, you've got to get out and you've got to run especially if you're Anthony Richardson. One of the things that was kind of bizarre in this game was that they were using him as a runner early and he looked awesome. Now, again, that's kind of what we expect. <laughs> he has a size athleticism combination that is unheard of. He had to play late in this game where he scrambles and then he slides. If you're Anthony Richardson, the whole point is that you're going to go ahead and use that body. If you are bulldozing defenders early in the game, on design runs, go ahead and bulldoze them on your scrambles late when you are trying to win the game. But this particular play, he feels the phantom pressure. He takes a little bit of a step up and then he throws the ball down the field. It's not clear who he was throwing it to, but it was not like a throw to the sidelines or a throw 15 yards out of bounds. It was not a throwaway situation. It was a pass that was obviously targeted to someone on his team but that landed so far away from his receivers that he was called for intentional grounding. I'm sure that this has actually happened before. You do every once in a while see situations where there's a little bit of pressure and the quarterback is in the box and they throw a pass and they get called for intentional grounding and the quarterback and the coordinator are just like, the guys read the play differently. It wasn't an intentional grounding. It was a mistake. This was one where there was some element of that, but then in addition to that, the inaccuracy of it I just, I don't think I've ever seen a clearly targeted pass for a receiver where the officials are like, no, you just threw that too far away from everybody. It's intentional grounding. <laughs> so we had that play in there. In the in the 17 incompletions, there was one intentional grounding on a play that he was clearly trying to hit one of his guys. Because it was intentional grounding, then they couldn't go for it on fourth down because the fourth down was so long. Now you could still obviously try it. If you're going to throw your passes an average of more than 13 yards down the field anyway, then why would you not go on fourth and 14? <laughs> right. I and mean, that's the, that's the distance you're throwing it. Just run another play. But yeah, we're still in the portion of the Anthony Richardson experience where there's some crazy stuff and there's some humor in it. If you're not Anthony Richardson and you're not desperately hoping he scores some points. Uh, the other note on that game, just as we're recording, it has come up. Josh Downs did leave this game with a shoulder injury. He's considered week to week, and it seems like he'll be a long shot to play this coming week. But it doesn't seem to be, you know, something that's going to keep him out longer term. But week thirteen in jeopardy, Sean. We are going to move on to two more games here before we finish up. One of them being the Seattle Seahawks winning sixteen to six against the Arizona Cardinals, who really struggled in this one offensively outside of one trey mcbride there's a bad interception in this game by kyler Murray. it's on fourth down throws an interception it's obviously a pick but it leads to a pick six that obviously is very beneficial to the seattle seahawks in a close contest that helps them win this one we have a bad red zone interception from geno smith every, every couple of games sean we have these kind of interceptions from geno and you're like 
yeah, what, what's uh, what's going on here? But we also had positives for JSN, and it looks like he has really emerged now as the the key part. I, I still think DK Metcalf is where they're going to lean to in a lot of plays, but he has kind of pushed Tyler Lockett um, to the you know the shadows. I guess we'll say Lockett with the three targets in this one, uh, JSN with seven, but seven for seventy-seven and a touchdown for him. Like we've seen with him in his game against the Rams, we did have a drive, which was kind of down to him. He has a 46-yard catch and run, which is the longest re- reception of his career. But then they follow that up with getting it to him in the red zone, which leads to his touchdown. So it's very positive for JSN over those last number of weeks. And uh, I think it's going to continue in that mold. A lot of his numbers, if you look and compare them, outside of touchdowns to Amon Ross St. Brown. There's a lot of similarities so far this season. Trey McBride, though, Sean, 15 targets, 12 receptions, 133 receiving yards. It won't be a surprise to anyone, Sean, that yet again he did not get into the end zone, but everything else is is looking fantastic for him. Um, Marvin Harrison at six targets, three receptions for 47. It's been a, a tough run for Marvin Harrison, drafters out there. He is only gone over 55 yards three times this season so there's a lot of you know ups and downs but those numbers that i mentioned for trey mcbride were career highs in targets receptions yards and yards after the catch he had 76 yards after the catch in this one which another positive showing off his athleticism there um he caught all 10 of his open targets which we classed as you know three plus yards of separation but he took them for 124 yards so if you give him any room he's going to take off and do everything except get to the end zone shot <laughs> that's what he's going to do but uh, he's on pace now for the season over 17 games for 103 receptions over a thousand yards 136 targets and you guessed it zero touchdowns what's your thoughts sean on uh on this one this game was a little disappointing because it had i think some shootout potential it has so many of the guys that we really like yeah. you'd love to see Kenneth Walker just running more effectively. He has the 16 carries for only 41 yards in this one. Now he does sneak out of the backfield and put together a good receiving day. That combination puts him in pretty good shape again, long-term, but at this point we need some true explosions from him. You you mentioned the odd decisions from both of these QBs, the Gino one, his teammates afterward, I mean, they're trying not to show him up, but the general sentiment was just don't throw that end zone pick. We can take a field goal there. The Kyler Murray one was a fourth down play where I think a lot of the sentiment is simply, you know, if we don't throw the ball or if we throw the ball out of bounds, we're obviously not going to pick up the fourth down, do something that might lead to a conversion. The problem is just that whatever that something is, it needs to be not a decision that's going to lead to the full interception return because with how poorly the offense is played in this game, that was pretty definitive. Now, in Kyler Murray's defense, the odds that you're going to sort of inadvertently throw a pick six right there when there are going to be a lot of defenders between the intercepting player and the end zone, probably pretty minimal, but you know it can't happen. It needs to be something that you have in the back of your mind when you're trying to figure out how you're going to run that fourth down play pretty shocking to see the rushing numbers in this game the cardinals have been so run heavy and i think part of that leads back into an offensive dynamic where when you have to pass or when you decide that you're going to be a little more aggressive in the passing game you haven't practiced it you certainly haven't practiced it in a game environment james connor completely shut down the volume from the other Arizona runners non-existent. And so you end up with this game where Kyler Murray throws 37 times. I talked on the show a couple weeks ago about how impressed I was in week 10. They seem to be a rising team that maybe he was ready to go out there and execute. And it certainly, again, for those of us who have Trey McBride on almost every team, this was the game and certainly one of the types of outcomes that you are sitting there for in the 
show that Ben and I did last week where we updated our 2025 ADP projections. I had Trey McBride in the middle of the second round. I think people looking at his actual scoring numbers and some of the other players who were there and knowing how tightly ADP is going to connect to scoring, that there might have been a little bit of skepticism. And I think it's, it's certainly fair to suggest that that was a little bit of an early pick on my part in terms of making the claim that he was going to go there. But in part, it's because of what Trey McBride is and what he can do and how these types of games you know, will be coming, right? You can only get this type of performance really from McBride and Brock Bowers. So I think you want to have that exposure. But the problem, you know, long term for him is similar to the problem with Marvin Harrison. It's just that Kyler Murray is not an effective passer. Even in this game where you have the volume, Harrison not being playable in fantasy is just absolutely demoralizing. He continues to slide, I think, in terms of how he should be viewed. Now, the talent hasn't completely and totally disappeared, but he's going to have to to build his way back up, sort of like Jackson Smith and Jigba is doing right now. They're very different players, and so their statistics at Ohio State can't be looked at side by side and conclusions directly drawn from it simply because they're going to be used so differently in the NFL. But one of the things I tried to make sure people understood is that there was plenty of reason to believe that JSN was as good or better than Harrison, or at least that those types of things, looking at them purely as a prospect were things that you should consider, not necessarily believe or lean into. But now that we've had this bad year from Marvin Harrison, I don't think that he is going to be knocked to the extent that JSN was, but I also don't know that he's got quite as good a path to come back out of it unless we get the type of complete renovation in the Arizona staff that we got with Seattle in the offseason. Yeah, and we we have seen a couple of flash games, but it, and I know I tend to be more down on Kyler um, out of the two of us, but... I just wonder about the quarterback fit as well in terms of the skill sets, but we have seen that working at certain points, but the the consistency of usage is is obviously very concerning. Um, so hopefully that is something that can improve either down the stretch or into next season. But the Cardinals now, uh, lots of questions, I think. you know There has been lots of questions for the last couple of seasons with how they are operating as an organization, but they are still six and five, Sean, uh, which is now better than the next game that we talk about the San Francisco 49ers, five and six on the season. They lose the Green Bay Packers, 38 to 10. The game was closer, I think, than the score indicates at the end of it. The Packers, eight and three on the season. Sean, you mentioned um, the game, you know, being excited. Or I, I, when you mentioned about the game, it was a little bit of a letdown. I, I thought in my head I was quite excited for that Seahawks and Cardinals game prior to uh, watching it but this Packers 49ers game you know you obviously get the quarterback change with Purdy being out you're thinking well maybe it's not going to be as much of a shootout but the Packers put up 38 points it it was a little even as a Packers fan it was a little bit of a a bore fest as it as it went through it Josh Jacobs Sean again time to talk about Josh Jacobs and, and Sean can say what he wants about the Packers he was hot about it last week but 26 carries 106 yards three touchdowns for Jacobs and this one um that obviously limited a lot of the potential offensive firepower here for the Packers. We get Tucker Craft in on a short touchdown for him. Sean Jaden Reed had three targets on the first drive, caught them all for 26 yards, didn't have another target the rest of the game. So obviously that is incredibly frustrating from that perspective. Uh, Romeo Dobbs had three catches for 54, did have a, a penalty flag that he drew you know when he he was interfered within the end zone for one of those touchdowns but he got pretty banged up on that play so the Packers was mainly Josh Jacobs now with the offense as well I, I do have to highlight you know kind of a, a almost a career game last week for Christian Watson he at the end of the second quarter and this one Sean drops a 49 yard touchdown which again changes the dynamics for a lot of uh, a lot of the Packers in terms of love and Watson himself but Josh Jacobs now has scored 20 plus PPR points in four of the last five games. And with that kind of coinciding, Jordan Love has failed to score more than 16.8 points in four of those five games. So there's, you know, both of those sides are taken away from the Packers offensively. The Packers, though, are winning those games. Um, 
what is your your feelings here on the Packers offense? The the 49ers on the other side, you know, we have the quarterback missing. That's going to hurt. They get nothing going in the run game. They have 16 total carries for 44 yards. The bright spot on offense would be George Kittle, who had six for 82 and a touchdown. The other one would be Sean, four targets for Debo Samuel, one reception for 21. I don't know if Debo's hurt, what it is, or is it just a case that Debo's not as good as he he once was as, as he passed at this point? This is a brutal game from Debo Samuel because Terrible. he was consistently having balls that were really pretty well thrown go right through his hands. Now, Allen probably doesn't throw quite as catchable ball as Purdy. I mean, he was throwing some rockets, which, I mean, there are some positives to that. If you can get the ball into tight windows, I wouldn't put most of this game really on him. Although not having Brock Purdy was the main dynamic that shifted everything coming into it. But at least one of those Debo Samuel whiffs was picked that kind of allowed the Packers to then just go and sit on the ball and continue to pull away. I think that if Debo makes that catch where they come out in the second half, they're trailing 17 to seven. They have a nice drive that ends on downs when Christian McCaffrey can't lasso a pass that would have allowed them to convert. Then they force the punt and then they're moving again. And that pass to Debo gets picked on the flip side of that. You get one of your Josh Jacobs touchdowns and suddenly it's 24 to seven and the game is out of hand at that point. Debo has always graded poorly on the catch portion of it. What he does so amazingly well is get open on a variety of underneath types of routes and then run after the catch. His ability there is completely and totally unparalleled. This 49ers team has not been able to set up those plays as much. And so I think that folks who believe part of that is on Brandon Ayuk not being out there and not being able to stress the defense with his route running on some deeper, deeper targets. There could be an element of that, but I mean, Debo just looks bad in every way. And so I don't think that it's so much that as that maybe Debo is kind of moving into the portion of his career where he simply won't be the same type of weapon. The 49ers have just been eviscerated by injuries over the last three, four, five years. Now they have so much depth. They have such good play calling. They've had such competent quarterback play in stretches that they're able to overcome a lot of those types of things. This 49ers team right now is just bad. And that's despite the fact that they have Christian McCaffrey back. And it's despite the fact that George Kittle is doing incredible things every week as a tight end. You watch the catch that he makes where he has to sort of spin the, around the ball behind him and past him when he grabs kind of the back half of it, catches it, turns up field, runs with the ball. I'm consistently blown away by the athleticism that he and McBride and Bowers demonstrate It's a lot of fun to have our teams built around those guys. I was pretty nervous plugging him in. We made the move to bench Juwan Jennings right before the game started. And hopefully that will be one of those things that does push us across the finish line. It's tough when you play this Packers team that sits on the ball, that plays good defense, that has a strong quarterback, that has a relatively good coaching. If you want to consider something that has this Josh Jacobs element going on (laughs) as good coaching. I mean, this was a a horrible situation for the 49ers. They did lose and lose badly as expected. It does kind of seem like Matt LaFleur has maybe some incentives in his contract that are tied to Josh Jacobs' touchdowns. I'm not 100% sure what we've got going on there. It's not that Josh Jacobs is amazing. I can tell you that. Jordan Love (laughs) looked good, right? We had the Christian Watson drop. That one tough because, I mean, Watson continues to flash. He continues to get open. You're At any moment, Watson could jump into the top 24 wide receivers and you've got Watson and you've got Reed. Romeo Dobbs running some fantastic routes in this game, taking some big hits after the catch. I mean, looking so good. The throw for Jordan Love when they get that Malik Heath touchdown late. Yeah, lovely. I mean, this looks like a team that if it were a balanced team that was leaning on Jordan Love would be right there with the Detroit Lions, not only as favorites in the NFC, but potential Super Bowl champions. 
my thought again would be just like with the Arizona Cardinals where they've run the ball so effectively this season, but when they had to pass it against Seattle, they looked pretty clueless that the Packers, even though they're going to be at a level or two above where the Cardinals are, they just, they're not ready to go out and attack and embarrass teams because that's not how they're playing. Now, they embarrass the 49ers because of the mistakes the 49ers made, but we're talking about when you go and play the great teams, are you going to be ready to bury them if mostly what you're doing is just handing off to Josh Jacobs? Yeah, I, I, I agree with you on that point. I also think that Love is looking pretty healthy. Still, I think they're probably concerned about him working back from that injury he had earlier in the season. I, and I, I do think there has to be an injury element to some of the stuff with the usage for Jaden Reed. Um, because it is concerning and in terms of how much success they have when they use them and the lack of time that then they they do use them um I, maybe it's a case that they're looking more so towards that end of season picture but that's not helping us at all here for fantasy but sean again like i talked about with the texans the picture and the the box score changes dramatically if we get you know a 48 yard touchdown in the second quarter going into jordan loves box score and um, we're just like i, I kind of mentioned it over and over and I, I don't know why obviously they're leaning so much on the run but they are running the ball effectively but when we look then at the receiving game we talked about it earlier in the season with wex we see it in this game with uh, Christian Watson it's not just like the highlight plays or the touchdown plays where there's drops there is time and time again week on week on week the wide receiver core for the Packers have have issues pulling in some of these grabs so maybe that's another reason why uh, they're pushing it in that direction but we'll hopefully have a offensive firepower week I did mention uh, last week that they were running into this you know schedule coming up where they were facing off with the 49ers this week and it was going to lead to potentially some big production moving forward offensively well that was for Josh Jacobs this week but they do get the Dolphins and the Lions and the Seahawks so maybe it's this week coming Thanksgiving they're going to have a, a shootout with the Dolphins hopefully that might be the case hopefully as a Packers fan they, they go on to win that one but uh, that is where we're going to finish up Sean any final thoughts on on week 12 as we close out we obviously had a lot of teams on by this week um you know you mentioned some of the players that were heavily invested in kind of help push us through those bye weeks i'm not looking forward to week 14 uh, lot, lots of week 14 players sean that are going to be missing for some of those crucial games but any final week 12 thoughts here such high highs and low lows so many of our players that we have been talking about on the show since january having huge games some disappointing results in some key places and some key moments that uh, balance that to an extent week 12 has so many emotions because it's about how many of your ffpc teams did you get through it was it was a long sunday an exciting sunday colin looks like mostly things are going to go well the depth that we've talked about all season with the benches, even in cases where we had huge bench points uh, that we couldn't take advantage of because we didn't make the right start sits, having that and being able to you know, use some of those advantages in the week 12 where there were so many buys. I loved that element of it. Rooting really hard for the listeners. We hope that uh, you were able to come through on Monday night and that you have your teams through. We hope in the other formats where you're merely pushing toward the playoffs that you're doing well, all your best ball is going well. Mm -hmm. Colm, I'm very thankful for this show with you. Obviously, the show with Ben, thankful for family. Uh, kind of right before the games started on Sunday, I had done a 24-hour drive across country. <laughs> it, was, it was rough, but made it through safely. I'm wishing... Uh, good health, good safety, and a wonderful time with family, with friends, with football for Thanksgiving this week, week 13. I think it's going to be a blast. Yeah, and I have to echo those sentiments from Sean. That's where we're going to finish it up for the second edition of Road of His Overtime right here. I am going to give a plug as well, Sean. I mentioned it last week. It's going to take me a while to get used to doing it, but Blue Sky, I am available over on Blue Sky, uh, testing out the waters over there. So if you are on Blue Sky, give me a follow, Overtime Ireland, or you can stay on the old X uh, with Overtime Ireland as well. 
But my name is Colin Kelly. You can follow me over there. You can check out all of Sean's work up on rotaviz.com. And until we are back, have a good one.